I also think what's exciting about healthcare is that it's undergoing tremendous change. And so there's really an amazing opportunity to jump in and shape it. I mean, especially with COVID-19. So I really think there's a great opportunity. Hi, I'm Susie Martinelli, host of the Girls in Tech podcast, where we're discussing the ways tech is always evolving across every industry while helping the world evolve too. Listen in, get inspired, and learn how you can use your skills to create the change you want to see in the world. Hello, and welcome to the Girls in Tech podcast. Today, I am so happy to have Dr. Megan Greenfield. She is a partner at McKinsey, and we're going to be talking about so many fun things, including data fluency, because although we know data, do you really know what to do with it? Dr. Greenfield has a chemical and biological engineering PhD. So for all of you listening who are have a passion in chemistry or biology, you can take it all the way up to the PhD level after I'm sure you will be inspired by Dr. Greenfield. Megan, may I call you Megan? Absolutely. Welcome. Welcome to the Girls in Tech podcast. How are you? Doing great. Super excited to have this opportunity to speak to my experiences and and learn. That's great. So you are a partner at McKinsey. That is a big deal. And I want to call that out because we're so inspired by women who have gone up to this level in the technology field. And we can't wait to hear about what you're doing with your PhD and all the amazing things you're doing at McKinsey. Can you start off by telling us a little bit about your role there today? Sure. A little bit of background. So McKinsey is a global consulting firm where you have offices in over 65 countries and do everything from transportation work to healthcare, which is where I specialize. And we span everything from service operations, sort of operational design to strategy and revenue growth. So really kind of a cross-sectional view of the economy. And what I'm really inspired by is our purpose, which is to help create a positive enduring change in the world. And as a partner, I lead multiple projects at a time and I build longstanding relationships with clients and really help them as they transform. Yeah, that's great. I, I We've all heard of McKinsey. You, you do, it is a huge company. And can you explain a little bit about what consulting is in, let's say, healthcare, for example? Absolutely. It's always a question they get. So consulting is really about helping companies achieve their aspirations. So it can be everything from we need to improve operational efficiency to we need to figure out, for example, in healthcare, okay, we just survived COVID-19. I'm a hospital. Well, how do I think about what the next few years brings? And so we help them break down that problem, structure it, do analysis on the market, what their aspirations, and really help them develop a plan to get there. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for explaining that. Yeah, I know consulting, the word consulting sometimes really vague. So we appreciate it. Now let's get into influences and trends. What do you see? So you're responsible or you're most passionate from what I heard in the healthcare of the health healthcare space. What do you see as the biggest influences in tech right now within healthcare? I mean, 2020 was quite the year with COVID-19 really transforming the healthcare landscape. So a few key trends that we see in healthcare. So one, you know, top of mind here is around tech, which is the embedding tech-enabled solutions like telehealth. We went from about 10% patients using telehealth in 2019 to over 75% now today are saying that they really want to continue to use telehealth. I mean, that's a complete transformation. Other key trends we see is really a shift to whole person in care. So looking not only at physical health, but mental health. And that is really changing the landscape, especially in the tech world. There's been over $4 billion invested over the past four years into mental health. And the last piece is really on how care gets paid for. So historically, systems have been paid for delivering services. For example, you have a joint replacement, you pay for that. And now there is a shift, especially accelerated with COVID-19, to be to paying health systems to keep people healthy versus just caring for the sick. And that's really going to change the business model of many health systems around the country. I love that last trend, especially. And, and we did see that start before covid and hopefully now that more people are into telehealth, they can they can stay on track a bit better. Paying for healthy, healthy lives, healthy bodies versus paying more for people to to be to have longer stays. So that's great. Telehealth, mental health, and paying for healthy people. Great. Now tell us about, you know, there's so much data that you deal with. And we talk about data all the time on the podcast, but data fluency is is something that's really important and that we need to discuss. You know, what do we do with this data? Like, how do you analyze and interpret 
and just dig into the incredible amounts of data that you get within healthcare for, for, for example, how do you unpack this? Absolutely. Data fluency is absolutely critical in this day and age across every industry and healthcare is, is definitely one of them. How I define data fluency is really about understanding, interpreting, and using data effectively. It's really important also to know and choose your data set based on the question that you're trying to solve, because there's tons of data available, but not all of it is suited to the question. And then if you break down is if you have a data set, the questions I like to ask are, is this data comprehensive for whatever the question is that you need? For example, if you're looking at a health system and you're looking about competitors in the market, if you're missing one or two of the key competitors, and it's really difficult to make conclusions about that. The second question after looking at comprehensiveness is, is it representative? So for example, if you're looking at these different competitors, but only half of their cases are representative and they're consistent across health systems, it'd be very difficult for you to compare the two health systems. So again, is it representative of all the services they offer? And is it, can you compare apples to apples? And the third is, is it accurate? So actually are the fields that you're looking at reliable? And sometimes it's the whole data set that you have to look and see if it's accurate. And sometimes it's just certain fields you know, self-reported data, for example, sometimes can be very challenging. You need to exclude certain things. So those are things I think about comprehensive, representative, and accurate. How do you overcome confirmation bias? Because, you know, analyzing this data has, you know, a very human element to it. So I, I know you just mentioned making sure you have all the data that you actually need and not leaving anything out, but any advice for, for avoiding confirmation bias? Yes, that's one of my favorite things to talk about, especially developing strategies. It's super important to avoid confirmation bias. And so just for those of you kind of not familiar with the term, confirmation bias is just as you get evidence, you tend to say that it supports what your hypothesis is. And so one of the ways that we work to address this is one, whenever you're doing a strategy, you always want to think of multiple strategies, not just one, because if you only have one strategy that you're looking at evaluating, you tend to always say that everything is starting to lean that way. The second is to do scenarios. So focus on what you think is the most likely scenario. Maybe there's an upside scenario. Maybe there's a downside scenario. And also in that, weave in some disruptive actions, right? So if you think about it, if we had just looked at 2019 data and, you know, for 2020, it's very different and, you know, not sort of apples to apples. You need to look at some of these different scenarios and sort of what the implications are. And the last piece is sensitivity analysis. So scenarios are thinking maybe the good, better, best sort of situation where sensitivity is really saying, what are the key variables that if they change a little bit, they will change the answer. So it's also critical to do that because that'll help you test your hypothesis. And I love breaking it down to good, better, and best when you're presenting, right? A strategy, because there there might be things that you are overlooking and you don't even know about, right? Absolutely. Is that what you typically do? Absolutely. And sometimes they're not always good. Sometimes there's downside scenarios, but absolutely you want to make sure you show a spectrum so that people don't get overly fixated on just one outcome. Because as we all know, especially from the last year, you never really know what's in the future. So it's important to show that range of potential. So what's your favorite part about the whole data fluency process? I think it's amazing. I just really enjoy trying to really understand what data we have and also think about what data we can generate. So one thing that I think is important to think about is not only understanding all the data that's out there, but what's the data that you can get. For example, on the healthcare space, you can do interviews. You can do a lot of primary research, for example, with patients to break down their experience. That's one thing I'm doing right now. So just thinking a little bit outside of the box to get a more comprehensive set of data. But I just get really excited about it because we're just at an unprecedented time to really be able to test our hypotheses and develop really robust strategies based on all the data that's available. Yeah, it feels like there are so many different ways that you can slice and it really, that's where your creativity can can join can kind of partner up with the more analytical and the more data side of things, right? Definitely. So one of the key things that we talked about before, and I think it's really important, whenever you're looking at data, what's really important is to actually define what the goal is that you're trying to get at. So this is always the first step in a strategy is clearly defining that because the question, what is the question that you're really trying to answer? And so the, the framing that we like to use, many of you will be familiar with it, just the smart framing of goals, which is being specific, 
measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bounded. And it's really important that measurable piece is where data comes into play, making sure what are the performance indicators that you're going to use to evaluate whether a strategy or a goal is met is really important. And then based on that, you can choose the data to pressure test and achieve that goal. So moving on to how the world is improving because of all these tech innovations and all this data that we have access to now. Can you share a case study or two on, in your experience, how things are shifting? Absolutely. Two different ones. I mean, first, we already touched on it, which is telehealth. I mean, it's truly amazing at how the landscape has changed over the past year from people wanting leaders in the tech space saying, come on, we can we can actually do a lot of stuff remotely to now full embrace of many services during the pandemic being virtual. In fact, many health systems reported a 50 to 175 times increase in virtual visits over the pandemic. So truly transformational. And what gets me really excited about it is that it increases the convenience and reduces the cost of healthcare, both really critical changes that we need in the healthcare system. And we did some research and we actually found that about 20% of emergency department visits could actually be handled through virtual urgent care, which would dramatically change the sort of cost and sort of infrastructure of the healthcare system. And we also found about 25% office visits, physician office visits can be done virtually effectively. So if you think about that, this is really a different landscape. And what's great about it is particularly on the equity space, is convenience. We are seeing that really helping because if you don't have access for transportation or perhaps you don't have access to childcare or frankly, the time to take off to make that long trip to a doctor and back uh, makes it very challenging. So people forego care. And so it's really increasing access for those. Of course, there's limitations because things like domestic abuse where you don't have privacy can also be a challenge and there may not be access to broadband. But we have seen even, especially in some of our low income populations, even a telehealth, it doesn't have to be a video conference, but even a phone can be very effective in delivering care virtually. So it's really exciting in terms of increasing access um, to care. Yeah. Another unexpected, gosh, I don't know to call it a bonus because of COVID, but COVID really helped, you know, people, even elderly people. I remember helping my grandmother get on her telemedicine appointments, something she would have never done, but now she's comfortable with it because there was no other choice during COVID. So that is a bonus where access has increased because people had an introduction to something they normally would not have had. Yeah, absolutely. And the other, the other innovation, which all of you, I'm sure, are, have read a lot about is, is the COVID-19 vaccines, right? So really impressive, especially if you look at the mRNA vaccines. So that would be my second from a tech innovation in healthcare. I mean, the concept is brilliant, being able to have instructions that are sent into your own cells to create the spike protein, express it, and then elicit an immune response. It's, it's truly transformational. What's exciting about it, it's really a platform. Platform. It's not a one-off, here's the vaccine, but this is a platform for many different types of diseases to be treated with this technology. It's very rapid. It's very adaptable. So I think this is really going to make a big difference in the future on the therapeutic side. Megan, can you please explain the RNA vaccines and, and how are they? Are they all mRNA or can you just explain that for folks who, who aren't familiar? So Pfizer and Moderna are mRNA vaccines and they as you may have seen from approval perspective, actually we're on the forefront because of their new technology allows them to rapidly create a vaccine. So it is a different, it's a different approach. mRNA allows you to give instructions to your own body to actually produce a protein. So if you think about DNA and then DNA produces mRNA, which is basically the instructions, the blueprint to say, hey, like go make this protein. This is going to be way too much complicated <laughs> to explain. No, no, this is exactly why I would tell, this is perfect. We want to hear this. Go ahead. Especially everybody has vaccines on their mind. Please. All right. So, so yeah. So, so if an mRNA vaccine, the idea is that we can put, so mRNA. So let me go back to the, the biology. So the way it works in your cells is there's DNA, which is the blueprint. mRNA is then basically a copy of that blueprint, which goes to the cell and says, hey, I need to build this protein. So basically the ribosome zone goes along the mRNA and creates the protein. The protein is what actually gets stuff done. They're the workers in the cell. They do everything. So what, what's really interesting here is that rather than delivering a virus, they actually sent instructions. It's very challenging to do because 
historically elicited immune response, as well as it breaks down. It's very unstable because the point is to be a temporary sort of blueprint, a copy of the blueprint for, for the proteins to build on. And so what they did is they were able to actually create this mRNA sequence, very straightforward to, to build based on virus. So they actually embedded in a sequence that then the cells will create the spike protein. The spike protein, as you've probably seen the pictures, you know, you've got spikes all around the edges of the COVID-19 vaccine. And that is what the immune cells recognize. They say, foreign invader, foreign invader, I've got to attack. And that elicits the immune response. And that's how your system learns that this is an invader and figures out how to attack it in the future. So it's a really innovative way. It's really fast, very modular. So you're also seeing potentially in the news right now that they're able to do booster shots very rapidly because as they do sequencing of the new variants, for example, they can quickly then create an adjusted uh, mRNA vaccine that you can then take. Um, so it's a really exciting technology that's not only relevant to vaccines, but also to many other therapeutic areas. That is super exciting. And, and thank you for explaining that in such detail, which brings me to my next question, which is your impressive background with your PhD in chemical and biological engineering. I, we would love to hear about what motivated you to take this path and, and also what challenges you overcame to get to where you are today. Sure. So I've always been interested in math and science. So I have a funny story. So when I visited Los Angeles, my parents took me there when I was a kid. On the way back home, I, I grew up in Texas. My dad asked me, you know, what my favorite part was. You know, I'd seen SeaWorld. I'd seen snow for the first time. And my response was La Brea Tar Pits. So if you haven't been to Los Angeles seeing La Brea Tar Pits, you should. It's super cool. Even now, many, many years later, seeing tar bubbling from the ground is pretty awesome. And I was interested not only in that, but also there was a lot of scientists there studying archaeology and understanding all of the animals that were captured in the tar pits, which have an unbelievable ability to preserve bones and other things. So I was really interested. So I was always interested in the science side, and I got more interested in math over time. I thought I wanted to be a mathematician when I was in middle school. And then the other piece is I was really interested in helping others. So I've always had a passion helping others. And that's where the angle with healthcare came. My mom actually did pharmaceutical sales. And I remember quizzing her as she was getting up to speed on all of the different diseases. For example, one was HIV. And I was totally fascinated to understand how does this disease work? How do we eradicate it? So that really got me very passionate on the healthcare. And so the intersection of the math science and healthcare is what led me to where I am today. I love that story. So not only were you inspired by your mom, but the fact that because of her, was it her work in HIV? Exactly. So she was in pharmaceutical sales. So she was trying to um, help physicians learn about some of the new therapeutic drugs that were available. And so as a result, there was a lot of research that she needed to understand about the diseases. So I would quiz her on that and I got to tag along to many of the talks that she would host. And so I got to talk to some of the experts and test my very naive hypotheses on how I thought we should be able to uh, conquer HIV as a middle schooler. You know what? That's where it starts. And and I can completely relate to that. I did some work in, in the HIV space and education and kind of non-branded educational health education stuff. And it was such a powerful space to work in. So I, I completely understand you being inspired to do more and to learn more on how to solve. So any challenges that you're, I mean, getting a PhD is, is no easy feat unless you, you found it just super exciting and it just, you know, you wanted to continue learning and more and more, which is also a very big possibility. Any challenges that you had to overcome or any advice for people that want to follow suit? Absolutely. I mean, being a woman in a male dominated field is is always tough. And that's always been the case for math and science, right? Is always traditionally kind of viewed more as a as a man's field. And and while healthcare has more representation of women, it still has a dearth at the top. So I think well, the big thing is, is finding people that can help you along your journey. Every stage, I've looked for people that can then help guide me, whether it was in high school, my math teacher who really encouraged me to, to push and really go the extra mile to when I was an undergrad, I found out the two chemical engineering professors that were women and both of them, I decided I wanted to tag along with them. So one, I made my academic advisor and the other one, I made my research advisor. And then just continuing on in my career, I was trying to find those people that can really support you and push you as well, not just make it easy, but really give you the feedback that you need to grow and, and develop. You know, thank you for sharing that because we hear this over and over. I, I have the privilege of interviewing 
women like yourself that have accomplished many great things and, and are still going to in the future. And people might think, oh, like they've made it awesome for them. It's, you know, but it's what we keep hearing is you, you've done this, you've accomplished this because you made space for yourself. You found the mentors, you asked, you took a step to make it easier for yourself in a world where perhaps if you just sit back, it it wouldn't come as easily as it might for some other people. Yeah, absolutely. Finding sponsors, mentors is is super important. The other thing is when you get put down, you have to take it and turn it. So there's a story when I was in grad school, I had this idea that I thought was pretty groundbreaking on a new research area. And I remember talking to a senior male research colleague and he just flat out told me, absolutely not. You're wasting your time. I was really upset and I was determined to prove him wrong. And that was, I really turned it into a motivation. So, you know, two years later it worked and, you know, he had written a research grant successfully on that, that method. And so it's just one of those things, which where you can go and say, I told you so, like I can make it work, but channeling that, you know, anger into a positive way into motivation can also be helpful. That's great. That's great. I'm so glad you did that instead of, you know, maybe feeling defeated. You were like, oh, really? Let me show you. <laughs> I love it. Tell tell us, why is it so important for more women to enter this space in particular? I mean, I think healthcare is one of the most rewarding fields there is. I mean, you're helping people in their most vulnerable time. And so I think there is just not, not much that's more rewarding than that. I also think what's exciting about healthcare is that it's undergoing tremendous change. And so there's really an amazing opportunity to jump in and shape it. I mean, especially with COVID-19. So I really think there's a great opportunity. And the good news is there is a representation of women at the top, which is always great in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So we, we are making movement love to get your help in furthering the cause. And as for skills or for people that want to follow your path, skills, job titles, what areas do you do you recommend might be exciting to try in this space? I would think of a few things as you're looking at this path. I think first, um, and this was you know raised in one of the other women earlier this, this season, but always seek experiences to stretch yourself. So I don't think there's a specific role or title, but, and not think about not just technical skills, but also the, you know, softer skills, which is leading teams, project management, really important skills for you to progress. So that would be one. I think the second one, as you think about where you want to go, I like to think about me and everyone that I, I, you know, sponsor as you're the CEO of your career and if you need to build a board of directors. So think about about if you want to switch fields, then you need to think about who do you need on that board of directors to give you advice? Because if it's only people that you're currently working with, that's not where you want to spend kind of the next five or 10 years, then it's, you're probably not going to get as diverse perspective that what you need. And then the last piece we talked about, which is sponsorship. I mean, I, I couldn't uh, emphasize this more, but finding sponsors that can apprentice you, they tell you what you, they really think, not just you're doing a great job. They're not cheerleaders. They're apprentice, they apprentice you. And then you need to return that favor for others. No matter how junior you are, there are others that you can sponsor as well. And we all need to help everyone at every stage of our careers. And again, this is really incredible advice. And we have also heard that, you know, create your own board of directors, essentially become your own advocate and go for it. You know, people will push you and open doors for you, but you really have to do it for yourself. So thank you for, for reiterating that. Any final words of wisdom? One thing I would like to share, a lot of people talk about work-life balance and my perspective on that, because it's of course important, is that it's important to have sustainability, but I find work-life balance to be overly simplistic because it implies that work is bad and life is good. And so the way I like to think about it, which I find helpful is building sort of a sustainable you know, career as well as family life is that everything is either an energy restorer or an energy detractor. And you want to make sure that you have energy restorers every day. Don't put too many energy detractors all at once. And so thinking a little bit at a more granular level, I find to be a more actionable way versus sort of just good versus bad. Oh my gosh. I'm so glad you brought that up. That question, actually, that that subject annoys me sometimes. I don't know if it does to other people because work-life balance, oh, how do you do it all? I get that all the time. And it's it's annoying because the things that I, I'm doing, I love. So they propel me, even if it's a lot, right? And also it seems like 
I get that question more than my male counterparts do. <laughs> so I, I get annoyed by it, but I love what you just said. Energy restorer versus energy detractor for all of us to spread ourselves thin thinking about it in those ways, I think uh, is really empowering. And, and I haven't heard it like that before. So thank you. Thank you for that. Okay. So I want to thank you on behalf of the Girls in Tech podcast for being on here and not only telling us about what's going on in healthcare, all the incredible technological shifts that are happening, partly because of COVID and partly because of where we are in the world, what we're doing right now, but also how you have really been an inspiration to, to so many and what you're doing right now. So thank you for everything that you do. And thanks for being on the Girls in Tech podcast. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Were you inspired by what you heard today? Head over to girlsintech.org to find more resources for starting and advancing a career in tech, including our jobs board and personal and professional development programs designed to help you excel. And be sure to tune in every week for new episodes. See you next time. The Girls in Tech podcast is a production of Girls in Tech and Podcast Network Solutions.